What I want you to understand is that obedience is God's foundational training ground. You don't even know God has your heart until you do what he says when it doesn't feel good. You don't know that God has your heart until you do what he says when it hurts. And I want you to understand this. God understands the difference in moving into the land and occupying the land as his people. Well, welcome to Anchor. If you have a Bible, go ahead and get that out and turn to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter one. We're gonna be, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been through a marriage or in dating, love, sex, and marriage series going through the book of Joshua, but you know it's gonna be fun. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, who's Joshua? He's like the dude that conquered the entire promised land. He's the guy that came and led, led the most powerful military battle ever in history. And, um, and he, he knows all about saving the date. He'd had a date in his mind all, for a long time about a promise that God had given him. And God gave him really clear instructions about what it was gonna be like to not just own that land, but go and possess it, go and move into the promise that God had for him. And it was, it was a picture, it's a powerful picture of our relationship with God, of our relationship with Jesus Christ, and God's covenant purposes for marriage and the family and even the church. And so um, the word dating, I don't know if you're familiar with this, if you've actually looked this up or studied it before, but the word dating um, is not a real old term. It's not a term that's been used for a long time, maybe just 150 years. And it was, it was said of a major leader, and I forgot their name, that they were in a relationship with a girl, and when, when she broke up with him, dating meant, meant that she had occupied all of the dates of her life with somebody else and it broke her, his heart. Are y'all with me? So basically, he can't get her digits no more, no time no more, ain't got no friends and no coffee no more. He can't get on her calendar anymore. There's no dates available for him. So to be dating somebody means this. It means to occupy the top priority of someone's calendar, schedule, time, and space. That's what it means to date. So you don't get married and stop dating, amen? Can I get an amen, somebody? In this series, the phrase save the date means this. It means to restore the priority and purposes of God in your dating and marriage relationship. That's what it means. And so whether you're single or you're a, you know, a stalker hanging out at church looking for somebody to date, you know, or you're like, you're like always in somebody's DMs or whatever, like I don't, regardless of where you are in your dating relationship, in your seeking, or where you are in marriage, whether you've been married one time, two times, three times. I have friends who've been married like nine, 10, 11 times. I mean, you know, if that's you, we, we, we're gonna work, we're gonna get work together and get your picker fixed. Are y'all with me? <laughs> Regardless of where you are, I really believe this. I believe God has something to speak to every single one of you, especially teenagers, young adults, people today that are actually thinking, this isn't for me, it's for sure for you. And so save the day, it's all about getting God at the top in regards to priority of love, sex, and marriage. And the reason we're going through Joshua is because I just think the timing of this, of moving into the land and all those things are so symbolic. So I want to read with you from Joshua chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Let's read the word together. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Okay, Moses is called the servant of the Lord many, many times in the Bible. Joshua is not called the servant of the Lord in the book of Joshua or the whole Bible until the very end. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 29 is the first time the Bible calls him the servant of the Lord. And what it means is that he's a representation, he's a representative of the Lord. And what it introduces Joshua as, watch the difference, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. That word aid there means servant. He's the servant of Moses. So even in writing the Bible, it distinguishes that there's a servant of the Lord, one who hears from God, ministers from God. And now Moses' aid becomes the commander and leader of the whole nation of Israel. But he's not even referred to as a servant of the Lord yet because he hasn't proven he can hear God and do what he says. It's a big, big deal. But he's a faithful servant, a faithful leader throughout many, many. You see his name probably 10, 15 times as going up Mount Sinai with Moses. He's, he's always with Moses. He's, he's one of the two spies that went back into, from the land and came back with a good report. And he and Caleb are the ones who get to occupy the land. So Joshua is a, is a powerful name. He's also, I'll let you know, the word Joshua, Yahashua is how you pronounce it in Hebrew, Yahashua. And that, that word in English, is Jesus or Joshua. 
Yahashua. And it, it actually, Jesus is Isus. That's Greek. The Greek word for Jesus is, is Isus. But his Hebrew name was Yeshua. Some even say Yahashua. And what the name means is the Lord saves or the Lord delivers. The Lord saves or the Lord delivers, okay? So verse 2. God says to, to Joshua, my, Moses, my servant is dead. That's very important. Very black and white. The old is gone. The past is over. We're moving forward. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. Can I get an amen? And I, as I promised Moses, your territory, now he gives him the boundaries. You can't just go start conquering whatever territory you want if God hadn't given it to you. Come on, somebody. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, that's at the north, from the great river Euphrates, that's way over to the east, all of the Hittite country and to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. It's like the whole, all of what's currently Israel, plus a little bit and all the Hittite country into the Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you. Of course they can stand against you, but they won't stand long is what he's saying. Whatever comes against you is not gonna prosper is what he's saying. All the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. Come on, so knuckle bump your neighbor and say, you're not alone. You may feel alone, but you're not alone. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Come on, he says this four times, four times. This phrase, be strong and courageous, is mentioned here. Be strong and courageous because, why should I be strong and courageous? Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong, that phrase is used 300 times in scripture. And be very courageous, that's used 41 times. Be careful to obey all of the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. The key to your success in marriage is not how pretty you are, attractive you are, your relationship skills. It's doing what God says. That's what he's saying here. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate, that means to chew, regurgitate, bring it up over and over and over. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And so Joshua ordered the officers. These are not military officers. These are just community leaders of the people. Go through the camp and tell the people, Hey, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, everybody say three days. It's three weeks for us, but three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here and go in and take possession of the land. The Lord, your God, is giving you for your own. And then he makes some provisions for a group of people who aren't gonna live in the land, but they're gonna help go conquer it. There's a lot of people that help you get where God's led you to be. It's the whole of the sermon. Verse 16. Then the Lord, they answered Joshua, every person, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. Come on, say that phrase out loud. Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, they did not fully obey Moses. <laughs> if you know your Bible, they spent 40 years in the wilderness because they did not obey Moses and they grumbled and complained. But come on, not every vow is as strong as the others. Are y'all with me? Come on, somebody. <laughs> that humbles me. Whew. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we'll obey you. Only may the God, only may the Lord your God be with us, with you, sorry, as he was with Moses. And here they go. Watch this. <clears throat> Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them will be put to death. <laughs> They're like, we're serious. Joshua, you be strong and courageous. Today, I wanna to share a message with you called prepared for promise, prepared for promise. Write that phrase down on your phone, your notes, your hand, your forehead, your heart, prepared for promise. And um, let's pray.
Father, we love you. We worship you. We welcome you here today. I know my friends came to hear from you and not a man. So Lord, we ask you to speak today in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Come on, high five your neighbor and say, you look like you lost a little bit of weight. High five. I'm telling that. Some of y'all didn't do it because y'all don't want to lie in church. Come on now. <laughs> this is a, uh, a picture frame that's up in my house uh, in, our, in our office area. It has a lot of dates on it. I don't know if you can read them or not, but the top one says 080301. That's Shelby Elizabeth. That's our oldest. And the other one is 112204, and that's Hayden. And another one is 22807. That's our 16 year old birthday girl, Kennedy. I think she's serving in kids today. And then there's 9809, and that's Cassidy. And then there's 1111. Come on, man. You can't get a good, that's a good number. 1111, and that's Madeline Grace. Well, when I'm talking about saving the date, this is the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one where God comes in and does a miracle and makes two people one. You're not one with your kids. That's sick. You're not in covenant relationship with your kids. They're meant to leave and cleave. Come on, somebody. They're meant to leave you. Moses, my servant, is dead. Be courageous. Move on. There's, there's, you have a messed up relationship if you're clinging too tight to your kids or too tight to your past or too tight to your parents and all that. There's one relationship here, and it's the one that enters into covenant with God. If you're single, it's the date that he's preparing you for. You see, every day before Sarah and I became one mattered. Every relationship I was with, every soul tie, every, every person that was in my head, every, every girl that I traumatized by kissing, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, why are y'all laughing? Everything I united my heart with affected that date. And every day after that is based on what happened on that date. God prepared me for marriage, and on that date, he prepared me for marriage. On that date, he set me aside as I set aside that date. As we became one on that day, a miracle happened. 400 people got dressed up and were in a room. There was, we, I mean, I had to go pay for friends to stand in as groomsmen for me because my wife had so many friends. We had like 13 or 14. I'm like, I don't even know that many people. That date was special. Like I wrote songs. We, we, we set aside. We went on a honeymoon afterward. Come on, wore a sweater and a 1999 white Camaro in Maui, Hawaii. It was so much fun. I saved up a lot of money. I threw paper. I threw, y'all know what newspapers are? I threw newspapers to make extra money, to save up money, to buy that ring and pay for that, that trip to Maui. And it was all a celebration of that date. And come on, 25th anniversary is coming up in January, 2024. I'm just telling y'all, we're going to be gone. We are not going to be around here. Somebody else going to be preaching. Somebody else going to be keeping our kids. Sarah, she's not even in here today, but y'all be sure and tell her. Jeff said y'all are gone next anniversary. I'm saving up for it. I'm talking about saving the date. I want to give you two issues today about dating and marriage. And the issue number one is called obedience issues. Obedience issues. I want you to write it down. I want you to write down the phrase obedience issues. One of the things that's really encouraging to me about the, the, the church and even that song we just sang Christ is my firm foundation. What's, what's really encouraging to me about the building that we have is like before, when we bought the land, I was out there all the time. I mean, I got, I got, I got some poison ivy, all kinds of thorns sticking in me. I, I, was on the, I was out there all the time. I prayed that land all the time. We bought the land in July of 2019. And after four years, we're going to possess, occupy the land. But that, that, that land was special. And when I saw them start to clear the land, they did something really, really unique. They went out and they dug 90-foot piers, 64 of them, eight by eight, 90-foot piers, concrete piers with steel all the way down the structure because something was going to be built on top of it. How many of y'all know the difference between a load-bearing wall and a decorative wall in a house? What, what is it? A load-bearing wall is something that's built on an actual foundation that something can rest on. 
A decorative wall can be removed. I saw Charlotte Gamble give an illustration. She preached over at Church of the Highlands this past week, and I saw this illustration that she gave in regards to relationships. It was really, really special. And, um, and she was talking about this, and I really started to think about this. I started thinking about our church and our families and our marriages, about how many of you are more interested in decorative walls versus load-bearing walls. You're dating decorative walls, people that are not going to hold you up in a storm, people that are not going to be with you when times get hard. They've practiced dating for 10, 15 years, and they're used to breaking up when things get hard, and that's exactly what they're going to do to the vow, going to break up. Dating is really divorce practice. How many of y'all know that? Dating is divorce practice. It's actually what Michael Todd actually preached a message on dating. He has a whole series on dating. It's really, really good. If you hadn't read the book, you can get it. He's a pastor up in Oklahoma. And he talks about dating, the difference in dating versus intentional dating. Intentional dating is where you're literally intentionally setting aside the person and building an intimate relationship with a person that's not getting too physical too fast. It's not over, it's not using the person or manipulating the person or not obligating the person or controlling the person. It's literally, you're intentionally dating them to discover if this is the person that God has for you to spend the rest of your life with. And for some of us, you're like, I wish I knew that before I got married because now I'm married and I feel stuck. Okay, that's, that's a whole other topic. It's a whole other issue. What I want you to know today is that load-bearing walls are essential, is essential. And you're like, what is a load-bearing wall? It's nothing if there's not a foundation. A load-bearing wall is just a wall unless there's a foundation. And the foundation of dating and the foundation of marriage is not attraction, it's not love, it's not even priorities. Your priorities, it's obedience. You're like, what is that? Let me, I want to show you something, and if I could turn it sideways, I'm going to use this model throughout the series. And I only put two on there today because it would have taken me too long to do three. I'm doing the third one next week, okay? Don't skip next week, okay? But I want to show you this model I'm going to stand to the side and point to it, and I think I'm, I'm trying not to get in all your, your way, but the bottom is rebellion, the top is compliance, the middle is obedience. This is a pyramid if you're listening on podcast, or you can go to YouTube, our channel at YouTube, and you can watch the video there. But trust is the fourth one at the top, and whole is the peak. Um, what you can't see real clear is the two words right here on the side of this scale, and the two words are fear at the bottom and whole at the top. And I want to give you a, a, little, a little illustration and ask you a couple of questions. What would it look like, listen to me carefully, if your children moved from rebellion to compliance? How many of y'all would think that would be a great day? Come on. Well, we, we, got, don't be, we got some good golf clappers at Anchor. Yeah, because like with kids, it's amazing if a child moves from rebellion to just doing what you said, like not cleaning their room, not brushing their teeth, not doing their homework, not eating whatever, you know, not, 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 they're, it's like they're, or they're, or they're actually listening to what you told them not to listen to. They're watching what you told them not to watch. They're, they're going direct opposite of what you've said. And so if you get them to the point of just compliance, do you have their heart? No, they may just be complying so they don't get in trouble anymore or they get their phone back or they get some privileges, right? What's the difference when a person moves from compliance to obedience? Whoa, that's dangerous ground because at that point, they're starting to obey you from their heart as long as they get what they want. And what I want you to understand is that obedience is God's foundational training ground, Obedience is the foundational training ground. You don't even know God has your heart until you do what he says when it doesn't feel good. You don't know that God has your heart until you do what he says when it hurts. And I want you to understand this. God understands the difference in moving into the land and occupying the land as his people. God's goal for Joshua was not to go kill the giants, kill the enemies, take over the territory, and occupy all of their houses. That was not his goal. His goal was that his presence permeated the people who moved into the land and established covenant relationship in that culture. It wasn't just about taking ground and kicking tail and taking names as red, white, and blue Americans. That's not the goal of conquesting and dominion as a church. That's not it. It's the presence of God. And God has one vision 
His vision is family. That's his only vision. His vision is family. His vision from the beginning was one man and one woman together for life. That was his vision. His vision was kids that actually grew up in a culture where God is first, God is the priority, where love, sex, and marriage were celebrated in the covenant union of one God with one man and one woman for life. That's the ideal. Now, I understand there's a major gap in all of our ideals and our reels. Would y'all agree? How many of y'all have a real life that's equal to your ideal? No, that's what we all, we all need grace. I'm not beating anybody up. And I'm not talking about your past marriages today at all. We're talking about the one you're in. That's all we're talking about today. The one we're in or the one you're about to get into, Amen. Joshua 1, verse 4 through 6 says this. God, watch the, watch the clarifications that God gives here just in this whole charge. Because we hold on to phrases like this. Be strong and courageous. I'm going to give you wherever you set your foot. Well, in the territory that I'm giving you. <laughs> I'm going to give you all you want in the marriage I'm giving you. I'm going to give you blessing. You're going to have you have fruitful in, in, in the territory I'm giving you. And the promise that I'm giving you. But I'm just telling you, you don't have any protection going outside of this. (laughs) It's dangerous. Come on, somebody. Are y'all with me? Can I get an amen over here? All right. Lebanon, Euphrates, Hittite, Mediterranean Sea in the West. Joshua knew the boundaries. He was specific and clear with the boundaries. Then he says this, no one will be able to stand against you. Why? Because you're going to be in the territory I'm giving you. You're going to be where my presence is. A lot of stuff's going to come against you, but it won't stand against you. How many of y'all understand the difference in what's coming against you and what's standing against you? Quick question, just write it down. It's a great conversation piece. What's standing against your marriage? What's standing against your marriage? What parts of you are standing against your marriage. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all, come on, go to the next verse, all that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you may be able to be successful wherever you go. Keep this book. At that time, they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have the 66 books in the canon. They, at this point in time, all Joshua had was what's called the Pentateuch. And he didn't even have like a, 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 a multiple copies. Joshua died at 110. He spent many, many years with Moses. And so he heard the law all the time. He went up Mount Sinai when Moses wrote the law. He was there when he gave the law. He was there the whole time. Joshua knew the law, but the law was not in the 600,000 Israelite men. And it more than that, because it was 600,000 when they left Egypt. You got nearly a million men plus wives and kids, and you got to get this inside of them, Joshua. Success is going to come to the degree that the people obey this. There, there were all kinds of other books. There were Mesopotamian books. There were Egyptian books. There were Hittite books, Hivite books, and termite books. There were all kinds of books. That was funny. I mean, that was a great joke, and y'all missed it. Like, that was... All kind of books. He said, this book, this book of the law I'm giving you. So I'll tell you this. I don't apologize for it at all. I'm going to get real specific with it in the next few statements. Obedience is more important than outcomes. Write down this phrase. Obedience is more important than outcomes. Obedience is more important than outcomes. Well, if I do what God says, they probably will break up with me. Obedience is more important than outcomes. If I do what God says, if I actually do what God says, he's going to call me a control freak and a holier than thou and a bigot. Obedience is more important than outcomes. Let me give you another ways. Another phrase. Obedience means this. The Bible as we have it is God's word. Do you, do you understand that? There is no other book. The Bible as we have it is God's word. God's word is reliable for truth and salvation. It's reliable. It's reliable. It's credible. 
I even, I even use the word infallible. That's a, that's a doctrine word, infa- the infallibility, which means it's perfect in every single way to save you. You're like, well, there's some inconsistencies. There's not one inconsistency in the entire Bible that matters about what we're talking about. Zero. You're like, well, I think this is like, that was, no, 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 no. I'll sit down with you and explain any inconsistency you see. I've been there. I literally pulled over on the side of the road about to quit the faith because I couldn't handle the inconsistencies. And it was because I didn't like what the rest of the Bible says. I had a lot of, a lot of stuff in my life that needed to be cleaned up. And so a lot of times when you have stuff in your life that really needs to be cleaned up, you don't want to do what the whole book says. You pick apart parts that you actually, you try to find flaws. That's what happens. But when it, come on, listen to me carefully. God's word is the standard for love and morality. Like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know about that. You know, I kind of like Beyonce myself, you know. God's word defines marriage as his exclusive covenant between one man and one woman. Well, hold on. That's not what the law of America says. Well, you're not going to be saved by the law of America. God's word eternally defines a man and a woman. My feelings and desires don't define who I am. Why am I saying that? Because I Googled, what's the number one love song on, you know, on the radio now? What's the number one love song? And it's... Um, it's a song, I don't, I'm not even going to name it because you'll look it up, but it's a song about two guys, and they're not, they're not gay, but it's two guys actually saying, like, um, love who you will, like, really just love who you will, and if it feels, who can deny your feelings? And if you feel love, love, that's love. Don't run from it, don't hide it, you can't trust anything but your heart. That's the, it's the number one song, Cosmopol- Co- uh, Cosmopolitan, yeah, I was rating that. And I, I looked at that, and I was like, you know, like, the, the, da- the danger is when your desires become your book. That's, you, I mean, we have never had more confused sexuality than we have of people living by the book of the sexual revolution that, that was unleashed on us. We've never had more confusion than when people eroded the book and turned to Kinsey's laws of sexuality, the Kinsey Institute. If you're not familiar with that, Alfred Kinsey is like a godfather of messing up sexuality around the world straight from Freud. It's a really serious deal. Like, you know, careful to obey what law, what book. My orientation does not determine my behavior. Thank God. I mean, how many of you wives would love for your husband to do whatever they were oriented toward or whatever they desired? Like, what kind of covenant do you have? It's really, it's not even, it's not even like just a popular thing. It's becoming a more and more wise thing to return to the book. In every way, you're like, well, what, what, you, the, the world, you're going to see in the next like 20 to 30 years when Web 3.0 and the whole metaverse kicks in and you have robots in front of your kids and robots in front of your life and you have robots tempting your husband, like, that's sick. No, 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 no. You won't be able to tell the difference. When all this kicks in, if you don't know this book, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Your, your, your desires are going to get triggered. I, I had a, a friend of mine come to me one, one day after our prophetic leadership conference seminar and told me, you know, I really feel for our teenagers and our young adults because they have it way harder than we had as kids, and that's exactly right. You teenagers, and especially in what's called the alpha generation, which is below Gen Z, the one that's just now being born and coming up, they're going to live in a much more aggressive, tempting, distracting, desire field labeled, and who knows what laws are going to be in the land whenever they are 10, 15, 20 years old. It is crazy important that this church, it's why at seven o'clock every morning, I'm live on the web teaching and preaching the word of God. 20 minutes, minutes, about a hundred of y'all tune in every single day. I'm just getting, I want, I want you to know the word. That's why we actually printed out another devotional. I think I brought it up here. Maybe I didn't. It's on the front seat there. I guess why, hand me that devotional, baby. One of my daughters. It's right there on the seat, that little book under your pinky. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a save the date manual. There's a daily guide in here to go straight through the book of Joshua every day. Pray. Come on at seven o'clock. I'll be teaching through it every single morning. I want, I want you to understand the word. I want you to know the word. My heart and my gut are not the source of morality. I was created by God for God's purposes and live for God's glory. And my greatest satisfaction in life is living in a way that glorifies him. Write this down. Obedience is my responsibility. Outcomes are God's responsibility. Obedience is my responsibility. I'm going to do what God says, and the outcome of my life is in his hands. Can I get an amen? Point number two, issue number two, is the trust issues. 
Obedience is a big issue, but a bigger issue is trust. Trust is a big issue because, like, trust is what's mostly da damaged so much. It's damaged with the church. It's damaged, like, in, even in a room like this because there's so many different ears hearing the message. And some of you hear things I'm not saying, and some of you hear things I am saying, and some of you are, like, getting excited about things you think I'm saying. <laughs> and that's the power of the word. The power of the word is that when the word's preached, we want the word to be clear. We want it to be a clear message, a clear call to Jesus, a clear call. But every one of us have been abused. Every one of us have had trust hurt. Now, I want to show you what I mean by trust. Trust matures most when it looks like obedience isn't working. This is when trust is developed. Trust develops most when it looks like obedience isn't working. Because watch this. For most of us, obedience works when we get what we want. When we live righteous, we do what's right, and we get the parking spot at Walmart. Come on, somebody. Like, it works. It worked. I prayed, and I got a parking spot. But obedience kicks in when you're praying, and she doesn't get healed. When you're trying to lose weight, and she won't date you anymore. <laughs> When you're actually going to church and doing the right things and it's not working out, that's when people start to punish God with their unbelief. They dip all the way back down. Can I get an amen? Are you with me? When you're obeying and it doesn't, the outcomes don't work, that's when you dip all the way back down in rebellion because you start to punish God and you and everybody else with your unbelief. You start to rebel. You start to say, well, I, I did this. I'm not going to church, man. All they do is did that, that little kid in you has got to grow up today. That little voice in you that's like, listen, I don't want to grow up into trust. Next week, come on, whole is the goal. That's where I'm talking about next week. I don't have time to unpack that right now. But I'm, I'm just going to deal with some trust issues, some real trust issues. Joshua chapter one, right in chapter one, verse nine says this: Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Well, how do I do that? You can't if you have trust issues. You won't if you have trust issues. Verse 10, so Joshua ordered the officers of the people, next slide, go through the camp and tell the people, get your possessions ready. What happens with people with trust issues when somebody tells you to get something ready? Look, where are we going? We're probably going to wander in the desert for 40 more years. I ain't, I ain't doing this. Y'all can go if you want to. I ain't doing it. And then 99% of the people go, and you're like, all right, I guess I don't want to be by myself. Trust issues, man, they keep you in limbo after limbo after limbo. Write this down. Intimacy requires trust. And the deeper the trust, the deeper the potential for intimacy. I don't know if you've understood this, but sex is biological, but it's way more emotional, spiritual. It has way more to do with trust. Sex and sexuality is never better than when two trusting people are in a covenant of love. Trust, 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 trust. Write down this phrase also. How you trust God determines how you trust yourself and others and how others trust you. You see, when you get down to it, the way you have a personal relationship with God literally deepens your trustworthiness and it deepens your trust in other people. How many of you would agree the more pure and better your life has gotten, the less suspicious you are of other people, the less controlling, the less manipulative you are? the more trusting that your heart has gotten, the freer that you've gotten. It's so true. I wanna invite the worship team to come up at this point. And I wanna, I wanna lead you in something today that we're actually gonna do as a family, a church family, is we're gonna take corporate communion together. My, my wife actually made the bread. It's not that fake styrofoam stuff, you know? Can I get an amen? And I thought, you know, what, is it, what does a table look like I mean, what does a church look like that really is centered around the table? What, is a, what does a church look like that, that is centered around the broken body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus? What, is, what happens here? What happened is on the very last night of Jesus' life, he sat in a room with 12 men whose trust was about to get shat shattered, destroyed. He was using language like, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to be crucified. I know you signed up to conquer the land. I know you signed up to possess the land. 
but it's not going to be physical land this time. <laughs> it's not. It's spiritual land. Oh, I wish you'd have told us that back when we were fishing. I don't know if I'd have left my nets for spiritual land. And Jesus tells his disciples, he washes their feet. He tells them, hey, listen, tonight, every single one of you are going to fall away. You're going to lose trust in me. Every single one of you tonight are going to lose trust in me because my body's going to be broken. My blood's going to be shed. And if you ever want to move up into wholeness, you're going to have to learn how to trust me. Trust me. When everything in your world looks like it's broken and bleeding out. He looked at them one night and he says this. This is the same night at the table, the Lord's Supper. They'd just taken the Passover meal. And he said these words to them. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Be strong, courageous. Do not be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. I'm talking about a promised land. I'm talking about an eternal home that can't be taken. No giant can steal. Today, I'm talking about where your parents are. I'm talking about where your loved ones are. I'm talking about that promise where you're leading your kids to. I'm talking about why we obey. I'm talking about why we trust. And he says this, if it weren't so, I would have told you. I wouldn't tell you I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to conquer the land myself. I'm going to conquer every demon in hell, every lying spirit, every abusive giant, every demonic power, every spiritual power, every spiritual force in heaven and hell, every perverse spirit, every, everything broken, every lying spirit, the spirit of divination, the spirit of Jezebel. I'm going to conquer every single spirit that's tormented you, tormented your kids, destroyed your marriage, but broke your body. I'm going to, I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to, I'm going to get a place ready for you. And in my Father's house are many, many rooms. There's going to be a house for you, a dwelling place. That's not, this is a dwelling place. It's a tent. Come on, how many of y'all glad? My, my dwelling place is going to have hair and all kinds of good abs. Are y'all with me? Like, I, I'm serious, man. God's got good hair for me in heaven. I know it. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to diligently work on your house. I'm going to get your place ready. Obey and trust. Ooh, the outcome and the outcomes, like his promise is the outcome. Look at this next part. And if I go there to, no, 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 back up. If I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you will be where I am. And he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. You know the way. Oh, what, what's, what's the way? Well, for Joshua, it was do whatever the Lord says, follow Joshua, follow his commands. Joshua was the way. Yeshua. Yeshua was the way into the promised land. Jesus is Joshua. You're like, that's confusing. It's the same word. Isus is the Greek word. Jesus is the English word. But his name is Joshua. Yahashua. Yeshua. That's his name. His name's Yeshua. He says, Yeshua is the way. The Lord saves. The Lord delivers. That's what his name means. The Lord saves. The Lord delivers. Then, how many of y'all ever heard of Doubting Thomas? Thomas chimed in. Thomas said this, Lord, we don't know where you're going. I think he was from like, like, um, never mind. I was going to pick on a city, but you might be there from there. So uh, West Monroe, Louisiana. How about that? Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Like, I mean, like if you tell us where you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going but where are you going? You're going to Denton? Where are you going? How, you, how we how we know how I don't know the way I don't even know I don't even know how to get out of my driveway I don't know I don't know the rules like I, I, don't, I don't even know what to obey what do I obey and Jesus says this I am the way 
I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's black and white obedience and trust. Jesus, we trust you and we obey you. I want to encourage you, and we're all going to stand in just a moment, and I want to encourage everybody, families especially, to come and take the elements, and you can go to sit in your chair and take the communion together, or you can take it standing up here, or you can you know, go to the side or wherever you want to go. There's some trash cans on the side, and if you can't find a trash can, just stick it in your pocket, all right? But on the night the Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and he says, listen, this is my body that's broken for you. As often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. And he ate the bread together with the disciples. Then he took the cup and he says, this cup is a covenant. It represents my blood that was shed for you. As often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. I want to invite you to stand together right now. We're going to go into a time of worship and singing. And I want to encourage you, if you feel led, you want to. You don't have to if you don't, if you don't want to. If you feel feel comfortable with this, I'd love for you to get out of your seats and just come up and, and get the elements, step to the side and go back to your seats. And you can take communion at the, at the tables, at, at the chairs there. We're going to go into a time of worship. And maybe it's a time where you actually want to come before the Lord and ask him. Like it, it's, I'm talking about a real, a real commitment of your heart. Let him speak to you about where disobedience is in your life right now. Let him speak to you about your trust issues today. And listen, stick it out through this series. Next week, we're going into what does wholeness look like. And it's, it's going to be a beautiful time together. Holy Spirit, I pray you draw every person who's in need of a fresh touch with you. As we, as we take the body and we take the cup today, Lord, we honor you. We worship you. We commit our lives and our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.